All right, should I go uh, ahead and introduce uh, our guest speaker? Okay. Um, hello, um, I'm, I'm Will Wilson, um, and I am a collaborator on our project, uh, Reframing Indigenous Remediation. Uh, so this is a continuation of the speaker series. Um, and uh, I'll be introducing our, our guest, uh, Professor Tanya Willard, um, who also is, you know, an artist and a curator, and, and she's going to talk about uh, that practice, um, as well as an exhibition that's that's currently up at the Museum of Contemporary Native Art uh, called Exposure, uh, Native Art and Political Ecology, and um, that exhibition in particular relates to the broader um, kind of impetus for this speaker series and and our collaboration, which is. Um, Kind of looking at the legacy and uh, the history of uh, uranium extraction and processing on the Navajo Nation. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, and I just want to also thank uh, my colleagues at Diné College who are, are helping to organize this um, great series. Um, and and I should also mention that we are, um, you know, we've been generously kind of supported by the Native Arts and Culture Foundation. Um, as well as the Indian Collective um, and Diné College. Um, and I'm coming to you from Santa Fe Community College. Um, I should just say that Kia'ani um, the Irish and Welsh, Bashachi, Tabaha, Da Shuche, the Irish and Welsh, Da Um And uh, I also, um, I grew up. Uh, for part of my life in, in Tuba City, Arizona, Tonanestizi, and went to tuba boarding. So, um, you know, now I'm here in, in Santa Fe. Uh, but so Tanya Willard um, is from the Sewa Pemic, and uh, please excuse my pronunciation, uh, nation uh, and of settler heritage. Uh, she works within the shifting ideas around contemporary and traditional often working with bodies of knowledge and skills that are conceptually linked to her interest in intersections between indigenous and other cultures. Um, Willard has worked as an artist in residence uh, with Gallery Gachet in Vancouver's downtown east side with the BAP, BAMP Center, uh, Centers sorry, uh, of Visual Art, I'm sorry, and the residency programs, Fiction, Trading Post, and Outdoor School. Uh, and as a curator in residence uh, with Grunt Gallery and Ken Loops Art Gallery. Willard's um, curatorial work includes Beat Nation, art, hip hop, and indigenous culture um, from 2012 to 2014. Uh, she co-curated uh, with Kathleen Ritter. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that, that exhibition was co-curated with Kathleen Ritter and, and opened at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Uh, and toward. Um, and it featured 27 uh, contemporary Indigenous artists. Um, current curatorial contributions include co-curating exposure, Native art, and political economy for the Museum of Contemporary Native Art here in Santa Fe. Um, and in 2016, Willard received the award for curatorial excellence in contemporary art from the Natitian uh, Foundation, um, as well as the City of Vancouver Book Award for the catalogs for the exhibition Unceded Territories, Lawrence Paul, uh, another name that I'm going to have a hard time with, um, uh, uh and she's also worked in uh, public art projects um, that include the rule of the trees in, 19, in 2019. Uh, which was a public art project at um, commercial Broadway Sky Train Station in Vancouver, and If the Drumming Stops uh, in 2021 with the artist uh, Peter Morin and uh, Cheryl LaRondell um, on the lands of the Papasish First Nation in Edmonton. Uh, Willard has also been recognized with the um, Schalbert Foundation Viva Award for Outstanding Achievement and Commitment in her art practice. Um, 
and her ongoing collaborative project with Bush Gallery, uh, which is some of the current work, is a conceptual land-based gallery grounded in indigenous knowledges and relational art practices. Um, Willard is an assistant professor at UBCO in Silic State, and her current research interests are her current research, research intersects with land-based art practices. <sighs> okay, that was a lot. <laughs> that that that's an incredible uh, short amount of uh work so so please um join me in welcoming uh uh tanya willard to talk about her her art and her practice thank you so much uh thank you so much will and thank you everyone who helped to coordinate and uh bring me in zoom me in today i'm joining you from sokwatmuk utluh uh, my home territories of the sokwatmuk nation uh, which I'm sure many of you will relate to is not just the geographical location of our territories, but also intimately links our language and culture. And I'm a student learning my language and make a commitment in my family uh, to learn uh, Sopatmuk's gene, Sopatmuk language. So I do want to quickly greet you in my language. White Kopaitip, Mesquas Tanya Willard, Slaka Kle Laweka, Neneskain Esh, Nesopatmuk Uluk. So I just uh, I just greeted you and um, told you my name, Tanya Willard, and uh, that I'm joining you again from Sofatmuk Utluk, but also specifically from an area called uh, Laweka, which is a traditional place name for where I live. It's also on the Scanlith Indian Reserve. So I appreciate uh, your um, your willingness to try out those uh, uh, <laughs> names and locations, um, Will, and you know, and I and I know that we are just kind of, I'm just um, new also to my experience visiting Santa Fe and the Southwest and all the different nations that might be represented here. So I just want to acknowledge also where we're all coming from and all the indigenous territories that pre-exist uh, many of the governments and systems we find ourselves operating and, and living within and under and subversively in relation to. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to give a bit of a background to some of my work in terms of how I originally encountered curating, uh, and then I'm going to move through uh, a couple of earlier projects uh, into the current exposure exhibition, and then leave you with some thoughts of how I am really interested in reimagining curatorial work and really centering Indigenous concepts, and but not uh, not really pan indigenous concepts, but I, I try to locate things within a specificity of my Sokhotmuk experience. And I am mixed of both Sokhotmuk and settler ancestry. And so that also informs uh, work. I'm gonna show a few images. So I'm just gonna bring up uh, those. Yeah, so um, we mentioned in the bio there, and thank you also, that was the long bio, so I appreciate <laughs> getting through that. Um, this was an early exhibition for me, so I wanted to kind of start because I don't think it's the most, and may, maybe this is changing, but for me, it certainly wasn't the most um, uh, transparent kind of career path to think about curatorial practice. You know, I grew up in a small town and uh, moved away to one of the bigger city centers, Victoria and Vancouver, um, to take to take an undergraduate uh, art program. Uh, and I still, you know, it took a long time to encounter this idea of curating. And it, what I, where I really came to it from was work with indigenous youth, both urban and uh, from the host nations and Vancouver area. And we were really just caught up in this, um, in activism and advocating for indigenous youth voices and making our own space to practice our own, you know, cultures. There was lots going on with hip hop and native activism with the native youth movement uh, that I was in and around. And I was working with a, a project called Redwire Native Youth Media Society. And we're, we were putting out a regular quarterly uh, kind of activist centered indigenous um, magazine. Uh, Indigenous Youth Magazine. And so it, it was really this time of uh, finding our voices and also asserting them within a space that was still uh, 
still very much not interested in those voices. And, and that's shifting a bit today. Um, but the context of British Columbia, where I'm in, which is a province in Canada, uh, is that there was sort of a lot of maneuvering by governments to join Confederation as part of Canada in the 1860s, which meant that there were no treaties with many of our nations. So um, from the Sukhumuk Nation, we don't uh, have treaty. There's a couple current negotiations that many grassroots people are um, against in terms of a treaty representing for us, extinguishment of our lands. So, you know, that's the context also, the political context of indigenous struggle and rights within this kind of province, uh, where it's really a continuum of our ancestors who's always asserted their presence, fought for their rights, and um, didn't accept the imposition of colonial governments. Uh, so that's kind of the milieu I'm operating in uh, many years ago uh, as uh, within Vancouver. And this exhibition, came about with an invitation from a smaller artist run center, Grunt Gallery. And they had asked me, you know, they were, we were hanging out with Grunt Gallery, um, doing some projects together and they were looking at the scene and, and they, and I, so I had an invitation from the director to consider uh, an exhibition that would bring out some of the ways in which indigenous youth were working um, through hip hop activism. And it resulted in this uh, ex exhibition, which had a few different iterations at smaller artist run centers, and then became this quite large exhibition, which uh, was co-curated originally with Skeena Reese, who you see in this large banner. Uh, and then later when it was at Vancouver Art Gallery, and what you're seeing is the um, promo for the show at the front, the facade of the Vancouver Art Gallery during a, a pipeline protest. And uh, so this iteration was co-curated with Kathleen Ritter, and then it toured to several major um, galleries and museums across Canada in Montreal and Toronto and Saskatchewan. This is this is my cat who you know wasn't around all day and now just like wants to get in on this. <laughs> um, so uh, so this exhibition happened in 2012. Um, and I wanted to sort of locate a lot of my early work within the, this, what I learned from this exhibition. And in particular, this image I like to show because, you know, I was working as an independent curator. So I've never actually worked with an institution other than collaborating, like as an independent curator. And so uh, many years after we had toured this show, the co-curator who was working with the institution, Vancouver Art Gallery, had mentioned to me that because I had made it clear to her that we wouldn't we wouldn't want to be tied to any sponsorship at the museum or the gallery that was, you know, oil and gas uh, deriv derived because uh, there were we were facing a lot of serious um, resource extraction and continue to in our communities. And uh, she told me many years later that she had to make that very clear because Enbridge wanted to support this Enbridge pipeline, which is an oil pipeline uh, that was facing a lot of opposition, uh, wanted to support this uh, exhibition. And I wasn't interested in having that, uh, the, the politics of that compromised. Uh, so, you know, you learn a lot of these, through these experiences, I learned as a curator. So I didn't train as a curator, I trained as an artist. And it's really through a series of experiences that come from a need and an assertion of wanting to see the great, you know, Indigenous artists who are around me uh, having a chance to show their work. So this kind of advocacy and activism, and as well as is connected to a continuum of amazing artists who were, you know, slightly ahead of me, um, or artists like uh, Rebecca Belmore, Anishinaabe performance artist, um, Dana Claxton, who I worked with when I was quite young, uh, uh, um, Lakota media artist uh, in Canada, and uh, Lawrence Paul Yakubalupton, and, and I'll talk a little bit about his work because I was able to curate a solo exhibition, co-curate a solo exhibition of his work in 2016. Uh, so this is another, just gonna make these a little bigger. Uh, this is another early exhibition I curated, which is the work of Nicholas Galanin. And actually these were some of the first time I showed work in Canada and I toured this show. This was again with Grunt Gallery. So after I had done, Beat Nation was sort of happening throughout all of this time. And I was also curating one or two other exhibitions. 
And this was done with the support of Canada Council for the Arts and a particular uh, grant that they used to run, which was supporting, uh, at that time we were using the word Aboriginal, supporting Aboriginal curators and people of color curators. And it was a particular effort um, of identifying strategic priorities to support and recognizing that there were very few uh, Indigenous curators working in Canada. And you know, that continues to actually be uh, you know, a, quite a small pool. Uh, there's lots of great organizations like the Indigenous Curatorial Collective, but in terms of, and lots of great curators working, again, often independently, but they're still across the country, across Canada. Uh, there's a few more now, so, but it's probably still six to 12 who are in permanent positions, right? So much of this work is quite precarious in the creative sector and is not, um, you know, full-time supported work with an institution. But actually this is the first show where, um, I toured uh, down to a Museum of Contemporary Native Art um, in Santa Fe there. And my first time I had uh, had a chance to come down there. And uh, uh, this show was when Ryan Rice was the director at the um, Santa Fe uh, Gallery. So I mentioned Lawrence Paul Yachwilupton before. Um, I just don't want to take too much time here on my on my back uh, log of, of work, but uh, this was an important exhibition because Lawrence Paul Yachwilupton, he's a Coast Salish and Okanagan artist uh, living in Vancouver whose work has been really influential. And he has a very um, politically assertive voice in his painting. So this image you can see here in the front entry, uh, this is this exhibition is co-curated with Karen Duffick at the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver. So within the context of, you know, a really um, iconic center of indigenous material culture collections, you know, which we also call our belongings. And they've also done a ton of work with communities, but it's just within that context, right? And they have a contemporary gallery. And so this was quite a moment to bring Lawrence's very urban political voice and his, uh, his use of Northwest Coast art. And you'll remember I said he's, a, he's Coast Salish and Okanagan. So he's operating in this way that's, um, uh, that's a, about the commentary on those practices, the commercialization of art and, uh, and the really uh, political assertion of indigenous sovereignty and indigenous lands and against resource extraction. So this image in particular, this painting uh, is of, uh, of salmon farming CEOs. And he has many other works like this of uh, anthropomorphized uh, figures who might represent oil companies or forestry uh, in his practice. And this was a large scale exhibition. We did a, a, a large um, retrospective exhibition uh, and it was really fantastic to see Lawrence and his work sort of affirmed within a continuum of uh, you know, the kind of great hall that's at the Museum of Anthropology with totem poles and this really iconic um, archaeological or anthropological collection, and, and then to insert this very subversive voice that is, you know, pulls no punches about the context of today and ind Indigenous issues today was um, a really important exhibition to define that. This is just another image, uh, really iconic, iconic work I had seen many years ago on the right here with the self-government now, and it's a transformation mask and originally um, named after a figure in, in Canadian kind of indigenous politics at the time. And uh, there's many kind of subtleties in Lawrence's work. Um, so if I zoom in, I'm not sure if I zoom in, if it's zooming in for you. Okay, <laughs> I just realized that. Um, you often will have these um, different, uh, you know, subtleties in the work. Well, they're not subtle actually, right, um, in your face, but uh, where he's representing different um, texts influential politics and figures uh, and he's really known for this uh, this surrealist approach to landscape which also really identifies the land as uh, as indigenous land and he often calls himself a contemporary history painter like he's painting the histories that we're living today I didn't even know I could do this much zooming so <laughs> okay Let's see if it'll allow me to 
go to the next one. Okay. Uh, I'm spending too much time, so I'm going to maybe not speak a lot about this compelling image, but this is uh, a show I curated with Helga um, Pakasar and Heather Caverhill at the um, Presentation House Gallery in North Vancouver, which is now called the Polygon um, Contemporary Gallery, which is a photo-based gallery. We had an opportunity to curate from this uh, interesting collection of uh, BC historical photography. This is an image of the Colonial Hotel in uh, Soda Creek, which is part of Sopatmuk Utluk. And for me, this was a really profound experience encountering this archive of, of the way in which the colonial project wasn't disguised, right? You know, we have this large, this large um, hotel um, named after the project that was happening in terms of um, settler colonialism within our territories. And there were many things about encountering BC historical photography, which is largely, of course, settler photography and also settler photography with Indigenous people as subjects. It was actually quite challenging for me uh, and led me to think a lot about, um, about the image and the historical image, of course, which many other Indigenous curators and thinkers and artists have contributed to, but it was this kind of personal experience with that. Um, and in fact, I, I wrote a text that talked about uh, thinking about photography in these kind of deep earth, um, these deep earth times and thinking about all of kind of creation, all of the things we experience as being this kind of long, super long exposure <laughs> of earth time in terms of the activation of the whole planet by the sun. Um, but so I was going into some other spaces. Um, and at the time, I'm also moving through, you know, had an opportunity to show um, some exhibitions at some pretty major uh, galleries throughout Canada. But I, I was feeling like I was still in some kind of position of sales where I was trying to bring Indigenous peoples in the gallery and they weren't maybe all um, coming on their own. And I, I felt like, you know, this kind of position of tokenizing as well, maybe. Um, and I was, I was just facing some real limitations to what I felt I could do there. I also had two young kids at the time and, um, you know, that things are changing a bit, but I'm quite deeply critical of the ways in which like parenting and caregiving are represented in our field, uh, which is to make it very hard if you're in, if you're a parent or a caregiver and you have responsibilities for that to make it as an artist or curator. And, and that led to really reconfiguring and reimagining how I would think about curatorial practice and bringing it back into a real close association with my art practice. So in the last 10 years, I had moved back to my home territories, enrolled my kids in Sokotmuk's gene immersion, was learning more about my spe specific territory and land. Um, I live on, on reserve on land that's my dad's land and he lives nearby and my siblings near, live nearby. So my kind of experience from the urban indigenous experience and galleries and urban centers really shifted. And so I activated this project called Bush Gallery, along with artists Peter Morin, uh, Gabriel Hill, Janine Freyna Jutley, and many others who've contributed to this idea, as well as in collaboration with the lands around me and everything I'm learning and, and am interconnected with. And so this is an image of a work by Cheryl LaRondelle and Joseph uh, Neitauhau, called the, they call themselves the Keat Collective. And this is a work called Light Teepee. And this is the first work I curated on my land. So um, the Skalmouth Reserve is a small reserve outside of a small BC rural town, Chase, BC. Um, but we're part of, of course, a larger nation, the Sufatmuk Nation. Uh, but I really wanted to pose this idea of, okay, it's great if I get to tour a show to Montreal, to a major city, but what does it mean to mount an exhibition and have these conversations within my own community. You know, a context of uh, le leading with and centering, in my case, Sokotmuk, but indigenous values. And what is, what is our idea of the gallery? Not just how we fit into the gallery, which, you know, I feel like we've already done a great job of. We've had so many indigenous artists really master that conversation. Um, and I wanted to think about, well, what does it mean you know, for me and for others I'm in conversation with to reimagine that um, from starting from an Indigenous kind of um, approach. So how would I think about a gallery? And of course, in a Sokwatma context, um, and I've worked with uh, elder artists like Dolores Pertibi, who's a Sokwatma basketry artist, 
if I really thought about a kind of deeper sense of our traditions and our practices, that, that was really then the land. The land is our gallery. It's where we're connected um, it, with each other and the lands around us. We're in this um, reciprocal um, relationship that also asks us to be responsible and, in, and be responsive to our lands. And so uh, this idea of Bush Gallery really came about as a uh, collapsing of the barriers between uh, the different disciplines of curating and artistic practice. And I started to operate more with this, um, this being informed by uh, indigenous territoriality as a central part of what I, what I was doing. Um, okay, I have too much to go in here. Okay, but then, then this like, that experience is beautiful. So that experience is so moving to be, thinking about indigenous lands and working with indigenous artists. This is myself and uh, um, uh, Maureen Grubin, who's an artist in Tuk Tuk Tuk. And we are at, at this amazing um, Pingos, which are these ice cored hills that rise out of the Beaufort Sea in her home territories. And I was able to work with her for this project where we um, commissioned new work uh, based in her home territories. And so um, where I was going with this kind of lead in was contextualizing my work and then really uh, the ways in which I was becoming very engaged in, in um, centering Indigenous voices within that and their experiences on their lands. Uh, this is another exhibition I um, curated with uh, Olivia Witung, uh, which um, are photo based from these uh, beaded works uh, that was at Gallery 44. And this brings me um, this is Will's work, so thank you for letting me share that here. This brings me to the exposure exhibition. And so I'm a little bit about some of uh, the works in the exhibition that are that I haven't curated. So this was a curatorial collaboration. Um, Manuel, uh, Manuela Welloffman, of course, the director there is um, one of the main curators. And she invited artists from other uh, geographic localities, um, myself, uh, you know, as uh, representing or not representing, but as bringing in an Indigenous artists from this side of a, you know, colonially, colonially imposed borders. So it's always funny when you start to do this international work within Indigenate, I try to not get myself caught in still defining who we are based on, you know, colonial ideas of nationhood, right? So these artists who I'm working with don't um, ascribe who they are to, uh, you know, a Canadian nationality. So I'm, I'm careful around that. But um, so I worked with artists, four artists who I'll, I'll show uh, coming up um, more particularly. And I also perhaps wanted to say that I approached this exhibition, which is, I'm so happy to be a part of. I was so happy for Emanuela's uh, invitation. And I think it's such a critical exhibition and so, so urgent. Uh, so I was really just happy to um, to bring several artists into the conversation, but I approach it, you know, as an artist, uh, as somebody who's interested in a political voice within uh, within a curatorial practice, and uh, somebody who's invested in that in the long term in, in my work. And so I'm not a historian, you know, and I come to this uh, with uh, um, less knowledge of some of the other works that other curators um, worked more closely with. So um, this is Will Wilson's work, right? Um, uh, Mexican Hat Disposal Cell and um, uh, Nav Navajo Nation, and it's the Connecting the Dots series. So this is a drone-based digital photograph. Um, it's a triptych, so I'm just showing one image from that. And um, Will, if I read briefly from um, some of the work, Mexican Hat Disposal Cell Navajo Nation is part of uh, Will's Connecting the Dots series. This drone-based photographic survey uses aerial photography to document the contaminated sites of abandoned uranium mines and mills and serves as a platform for voices of resilience. So I entered into this project, you know, where Already some fantastic artists like Will's work were, were already represented. So I'm just gonna go back to, I might not be, go, be able to go back to full slideshow um, to see my other notes. Um, uh, and I brought in a few other artists into the conversation, but where I wanted to perhaps start is also that with Will's work, I'm also thinking how um, the Southwest has what are perhaps more uh, blatant, histories of nuclear colonialism. And that's a term I embraced in the text and looked at this idea of um, so many indigenous peoples. And that's what this exhibition really brings together being deeply impacted by um, nuclear 
energy, mining for nuclear materials, um, reactors, experiments, um, all the different things that continue to impact indigenous peoples from this kind of work. And it really can be located also within this language of kind of modernism and the idea that the universality of science will, um, you know, will propel us into a new age. And all of that still has these deep links to, um, to the colonial project, right? To erasing what was on the land before, the knowledge that was that is still there, that is held there, but instead imposing these layers of um, colonial practice uh, that we have seen are, are just so deeply devastating. Um, so I guess in some ways this project, like uh, this exhibition could be thought of as um, quite a challenging one to, um, to think about. Uh, you know, one, I, I tend to be interested and engaged in challenging work. Uh, I think that I'm interested in there being an urgency in art practice, there being, um, you know, I, I come from that. I come from this experience of, uh, of really the, the complexity of the politics and how they affect us. And, you know, I think when we experience that as individuals who live in indigenous communities, right? Or have that, that experience and that heritage, um, then we see that urgency. And so I, I think that this exhibition brings together so many important voices uh, in how, how deeply um, indigenous lands continue to be affected. And I, I wanted to say, so though the Southwest is known more blatantly for that, Canada has this deep history um, with actually supplying a lot of uranium. So, and a lot of that uranium, like I think some of the numbers are like that 15% globally today comes from Canada. And during the war years, it was quite a bit more where uranium um, sources were mined in Canada. Um, so 85% uh, of that mined in Canada is exported. So we're exporting a lot of that material. Um, the rest are used for some reactors in Canada of which most of those are located on, in Ontario and the prairies. And the Athabasca Basin in the prairies is the world's largest source of high-grade uranium. And so there are these deep histories of, um, of mining this material. Um, uh, something Somewhere like the ba Baker Lake in Nunavut uh, also has um, current uranium mining propositions and companies. There are many based in Saskatchewan. And we'll see when I talk about Adrian Stimson's work, uh, those deep histories within the uranium mining um, which actually uh, the uranium used in the Hiroshima bomb, uh, I believe this is correct, um, was, uh, was mined in Saskatchewan. So there are these um, linkages over time and space and geographies. And indigenous pe peoples continue to, you know, um, be to suffer from that. Uh, somewhere like Baker Lake, some of the proposed mines now um, in the last few years are in caribou calving grounds where people have these deep um, relationships with caribou. And I had this quote that I, I read when I did the panel in person, but I think it's a really beautiful quote by Dene Elder um, Philip Zoe, who said, all spaces are used by something, fox, fish, trees, humans, wind, northern lights. It might look empty, but all the land, he uses his word for land here, um, is used. Uh, and so that sense that, you know, there's an emptiness of land that makes it okay to impact it in these ways, I think has, is also part of that manifest destiny and that salvage anthropology where we ourselves were invisible as indigenous peoples. And so those impacts. And this exhibition in, in its totality, you know, really counters that narrative. Um, what we're seeing here is a work by, by Gunibi Ganambar, um, who's, uh, you'll know, um, from Australia. And uh, the work talks about mining that's had this um, major impact in Northeastern Arnhem land. And Gunubi, the artist references those complexities with this work, which I thought was quite remarkable. It's a old conveyor belt that transported the riches of the country away. And I just think this is so relevant to so many indigenous people experiences where our material from our lands made the nation state rich or powerful, um, but were taken out, were extracted from our territories. Um, the other statement of this work, it's um, 
it was intricately incised, so cut into with clan designs for fresh water. And the detailed designs um, are attached to place since time immemorial and denote ownership of responsibility for country, rights that have been eroded as the surface of country itself has been removed and contaminated. Um, so these works all had these uh, incredible significance. Uh, this is a work, um, I'm just gonna get to the title, by uh, Marikita Mickey Davis. Um, it's Pacific Concrete Portrait of Christian Paul Reyes. And this was a really moving work. Uh, it's, um, it's an installation that includes a traditional Chamoru woven mat, as well as a postcard rack that holds images of her cousin, her cousin Christian Paul Reyes and um, his family. And her cousin uh, was only about a year old when he died of congenital deformities and anomalies that may have been caused by radiation exposure in Guam. Uh, so the work, um, you perceive this in the work, but also the tenderness and care um, that the work shows. And it really puts the human um, experience just uh, in a really emotional way. Uh, and it contrasts that with a kind of idea of tourism and the tropics and, you know, um, it, by this postcard device. And we really see these deep silent effects of radiation exposure across the Pacific. Um, you know, Marikita talks about um, the United States tested 67 nuclear weapons from 1946 to 1958 in what's now the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Uh, and so there are these ongoing, you know, like this isn't something that happened and then it's over, you know, these are, these are deeply ongoing um, effects in many Indigenous communities. Uh, there were also a, a number of curated um, performances and video in video form. This is one I thought was quite striking. Again, this is, I didn't curate this work. This is um, from the, um, one of the contributing curators, uh, Greenland. This is Jesse Kleeman's uh, work, uh, Inuit um, artist, and it's a video performance. And in this work, Jesse is um, on, the, uh, on the inland ice in Greenland where she videotaped the work. She performed in front of a river of fast flowing melted ice water. And um, Greenland, she talks about climate change in terms of Greenland's ice sheet um, melting four times faster than thought, uh, which will cause additional sea level rise and gives mining companies easier access to the country's uranium deposits. So we're also here asked to think about not just the past and the effects, but also the future and how, uh, how these, things will continue to uh, impact us, live alongside us. What, what do we, how do we react in the case of something like um, increased access to uranium? And this was a really compelling performance um, in the video work. Oh, excuse me one moment. Sorry, my phone's ringing. I'm gonna mute myself for a quick moment. phone, that ringtone is really loud. So um, should have the basketry work up. Yes, this is a work by um, Pat and Courtney Gold. Um, I was struck by this work. It's a sturgeon basket, twined tule, cattail, sedge, grass, red cedar bark, dog bane, and various reeds. I have, um, you know, my interest in land-based art also comes from Sokwatma practices like in basketry. So I was interested in this work by Pat Courtney Gold, um, this sally bag that signals the long-term dangers posed by radioactive exposure from the Hanford nuclear facility, um, which is a massive plutonium production complex along the Columbia River. And the Columbia River is also, of course, um, impacted for many years by the mega dams and all the stoppages along the river, which, um, which affected salmon migrations up to uh, neighboring territories here uh, for the seal people and continues to have these deep impacts. Um, it's one of the most environmentally contaminated sites. Um, and as a result, sturgeons who are a traditional food source are suffering from de deformations. Um, so the, the work is made with jute warps and cotton wefts with iridescent threads and the rims lined with hype and the uh, hemp, sorry, and the stylized fish and waves and reeds are woven in dark sweet grass. And um, so the work really brings in this uh, cultural practice, this skill-based art, 
into conversation with these difficult um, realities. Uh, so this brings me to, and I'm checking time here because I want to have time for conversation. This brings me to the work of uh, Adrian Stimson, who's a Blackfoot artist. Um, Adrian's really well known for his performance work, actually, in his performance persona, Buffalo Boy, which really explores queer indigeneity. Uh, and Adrian's work is uh, actually currently just opening at the Remy Modern um, uh, with a solo exhibition. His work uh, continues to have a really uh, resonant um, a real resonance with uh, with many things, um, but it, so I knew Adrian's work previously, but I mostly know his kind of performance work, and uh, he's also a prolific painter. And he painted this series in 2014. Um, there is uh, four, I think, in the series, and they all represent. Um, you can see in this image uh, that they represent a nuclear explosion uh, alongside of these quite delicate um, paintings of buffalo. And he's known for his representation of Buffalo, right? The Blackfoot are a Buffalo people. And he, in this series of work in 2014, was really thinking about those histories of Saskatchewan and the mining of uranium in Saskatchewan and how that was linked globally then to nuclear war and to the um, explosion of the nuclear bomb. And he, I was just fascinated by the way, you know, he was saying, I mean, that that wasn't the first catastrophe, right, for Indigenous peoples. So the, the buffalo, the almost extinction of the buffalo on the prairies um, had the impact of a nuclear explosion, perhaps more. Um, and I, in the curatorial text I wrote, um, I compared this image and thinking of the nuclear impacts with that famous um, archival image with the huge pyramid of buffalo skulls and bones uh, and, and I really wanted to think about that in reference to the interconnected histories of colonialism um, and the ongoing uh, present of colonial realities and uh, these nuclear impacts. Um, so this, uh, this series really brought that up in the conversation, looking at uranium mining, um, which built the first atomic bombs. and. Um, Adrian says of the bison, I use the bison as a symbol representing the destruction of the indigenous way of life, but it also represents survival and cultural regeneration. And in this case, this particular painting, I loved it in the in the series because it's a it's a buffalo calf. You know, this is we have this young buffalo. Um, the bison is central to Blackfoot being, and the bison is both icon and food source, um, as well as the whole history of its disappearance is very much a part of um, the way that Adrian. Uh, um, is just thinking about his work. And so I was able to do this through a private collection and bring it um, to the exhibition. Uh, the other work I brought into this um, conversation is a work by David Neal, a Kukwakiwak artist, and it's a Northwest Coast um, mask carving. And I'm just gonna get to my notes for this work. Um, this again was a work that had, um, that was an uh, earlier work it was from 1993 actually. And I know, I know David's practice and the ways in which he, use, he uses mask carving, which we think of as quite a traditional practice for the Northwest coast to comment on um, really current, maybe like geopolitics. So the way we might think about a larger context of politics, he's not only depicting traditional iconography or figures in his mask painting, he's often um, commenting on the world uh, through um, the, the what he depicts in the masks. And so this is his Chernobyl mask um, in brackets allusion to Bakwas or nuclear disaster mask. And it's um, carved in cedar with cedar bark and acrylic paint. And you can see these are um, what makes this kind of really iconic of um, nuclear um, story is these um, nuclear reactors on the top of the forehead in the work. Sorry if you're hearing a hiss, my laptop is deciding it's hot and its fan is on. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, but um, so those three nuclear power that are painted on its forehead are referencing the prol proliferation of nuclear energy um, and the recent memories of nuclear disasters like Chernobyl, which you know uh, we're hearing about today in terms of the insecurity of, of um, and the ongoing war in the Ukraine. Um, 
but uh, the work also is thinking about Three Mile Island and Fukushima power plant failures. Um, although the work, that's something that the artist is reading in the work now, because the work was done before Fukushima. Um, but these Northwest Coast masks are really, you know, are really also animate. Um, and so the mask itself is a kind of a being. And, and Neil explains this um, when he says, I base this mask on the Bakwas, also known as uh, Bakwas, or the wild man of the woods, which is a character from Kokwakiwa culture. He is the chief of the ghosts and he tricks people into eating his food, which may be disguised as delicious salmon, but is in fact grubs or rotten worm, rotten wood. Um, afterwards, his victims are trapped in the land of the ghosts. And so I pose this question, like, is that where we find ourselves today in this post-nuclear age, a land of ghosts? Um, you know, we certainly can see that specter of impacts and, and it's um, the way in which it might follow us. And so this work helped me to think through a kind of perhaps more, more spiritual, and I don't, mean, I don't mean that in terms of bringing in spiritual practice or ceremony, but this inference there to think about uh, more than the kind of physical aspects of how uh, something like this um, might be affecting us. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go through the next two a little bit quickly just so we can have a little bit of time for a discussion. So the next work that I brought um, to this exhibition was by Anishinaabe artist, Bonnie Devine. And it's an installation work called Phenomenology. Uh, and in the work, we have um, a few examples of uranium stones, which are just small samples. Um, Bonnie, uh, her home territory in the Serpent River is, is known for uh, the pollution uh, by uranium mining. And she's visited this several times in her work. This is a work from 2015. And uh, there are these 92 figural muslin sheets in her installation and 92 uh, maple stakes are draped with strips of white gauze and lined up in a row. Uh, originally she kind of made them and they, they had this um, fluttering nature to them um, when they're installed outside. But 92 is uranium's atomic number and represents uh, the 92 protons and 92 electrons in a uranium atom. Uh, and she shows these um, small examples of uranium stones at the center of the exhibition, which became a little problem. We had to ship the work from Canada, in incidentally, in terms of logistics. But actually um, what we had to do was they were readily available. You can order them on Amazon. And she was like, well, I actually just ordered that one on Amazon. So we ended up getting one of these Amazon uranium stones um, shipped from within the States instead of the problems we were encountering shipping it from Canada back to the States. So um, they're commercially available, which is interesting to think about. Um, but she's thinking about the ones from Serpent River, Ontario in her home territory. And in 1953, uranium was found in a mountain sacred to the Anishinaabe people near the Serpent River First Nation Reserve. And the subsequent mining led to poisoning off the entire Serpent River watershed. Um, the emittance, the radioactive signature of that stone kind of sits silent and loaded in the center of the installation. And it, we might think about those stories that are held, um, those deep earth stories, those contemporary moment stories, and the weight that it holds. Uh, so I just want to get a chance to show you the final work. So I brought these four works into conversation with the rest of the exhibition. Uh, and there's so much more to learn about so many of these works. I, I got the chance to visit the exhibition just um, on its opening and was just blown away by so many of the works. That there's just some incredible um, pieces that, and I think taken as a whole, uh, they're just such uh, impactful histories, realities. And I hope that, you know, there's some ways in which people are moved to, action because all of these things are just continuing um, today. Um, these impacts on families, on communities, on lands, and how do we, um, you know, start to address that not unlike how we're starting to, how do we start to address the impacts of colonization, right? Again, these deep see, seeping um, uh, impacts. Uh, so this is a work by Carl Beam. It's called Sitting Bull and Einstein from the series, The Columbus Suite. Carl Beam is an Anishinaabe Ojibwe artist. Um, this work is from 1990. He depicted Albert Einstein a number of times in print works over his career. And I was really interested in this particular work um, how he, you know, we might expect to see Einstein, the famous scientist um, in the dominant position in this work, 
But instead we see um, Sitting Bull uh, as the kind of more larger image, right? And Einstein below. And I, I just like the way this kind of inversion of Western systems um, was happening in the work. Um, and, and the way it poses this idea that maybe we're, we should be thinking of the genius of indigenous ways of knowing um, that warned against the disconnected rationalism that Western science represents. Um, and here in this image, I thought like spirit is stronger um, in this image and we're not vanishing in that image, right? Um, so sitting bull assumes a kind of visual sovereignty, which is a term I take from um, Tuscarora scholar, Jolene uh, Rickard's um, uh, important text on visual sovereignty. And I'm thinking about how do we destabilize the common attributions of the, of the atomic age. And so uh, that all also leads me, you know, that exhibition, that experience led me again to kind of deeper um, thinking and inquiry about curatorial practice. And I had a couple other things to maybe say in conclusion of where I'm thinking about in terms of curatorial work today, but it really kind of just goes back to, um, to land-based and to thinking about my experience living in a rural area, living as more connected to forest and how that informs my practice. But I do want to preserve a little bit of time. So I'm going to stop um, the slideshow there. And I'm happy to take um, questions about the exhibition. There's so much to say about that exhibition. And I'm also just cautious that, um, you know, I brought in some artists and, and some parts of the conversation, but there are so many more contributors um, to that uh, work and to that exhibition, both as curators and artists. So I'm hoping you guys, I'm hoping that people get to see this show. It's still on until July. I think, I don't think the catalog is out yet, but maybe, who knows, maybe it's coming soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tanya. Wow. Um, do you want me to take control a will of the Q&A or do you want to do it? Does it matter? Oh, uh, please be my guest. Um. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for that amazing talk. That was a lot of amazing, great information. I'm just learning a lot. Um, so uh, students and people that are have attended, please, you guys have the floor. If you are, you just don't want to say it, you're more than welcome to put the, your question in the chat and we'll read it. And if not, you are more than welcome to have the floor right now and pop in. And I'm happy to take things related or unrelated to my talk. So maybe you just wanna ask questions about curatorial um, work or ways of thinking or you know anything like that. Um, what I can um, share or relate to from my journey, I'm, I'm happy to share because in my experience, there was very few others um, that I could kind of talk with and, and it, yeah, it sometimes felt um, isolated to have the kind of journey and questions you might encounter in different institutions. Um, so I'm happy to share what I can with you. Um, I can start off, I guess, the questions and stuff. I think um, what I find very interesting about everything you're mentioning, how overwhelming and a lot of the information you were giving us, how do you find a balance between being an artist and a curator? I don't know if I do find a balance. I just don't even try anymore. I just like squish everything together. Um, I just, I felt like that if I really thought about it, it's the way I see artists and community acting. They're, they're kind of activators often. So, or, or they're engaged in important reflections that reflect ourselves back to us and allow us to approach things, to think of things differently, right? And so, I just sort of started to realize that that's a really, that idea that curator, and of course there's also long histories to artist curators and many contributions for ways of thinking, but I just started to think about how um, for me and for what I see around me, they are actually quite naturally aligned and the distinction of them as separate disciplines um, comes largely from Western practices. And that's not saying it's all to be thrown away. There's lots of interesting conversation there, but uh, yeah, I just, I, I just started to not try like to balance it or to take different hats on and off and to just really integrate them, um, you know, which has its pros and cons too. um, just really integrate them in my practice. I, uh, I guess like in part, like I, when my kids were small, it was like that became too many hats. I can't switch hats that quickly. So I just have to talk about um, my approach uh, to all of it. 
And I think the impulse changes, right? Sometimes our impulse is to be activating and advocating and sometimes our impulse is to be creating and sometimes it's to be reflecting. And so I just let myself do that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I had a quick question. Um, thank you so much for your talk and for, um, you know, really calling our attention to the importance of this um, exhibition um, on exposure uh, at the IAIA. And um, one of the things that I was curious about that you talked about was urgency in art. And I was wondering um, if you had any thoughts about how uh, art students could somehow tap into that uh, that sense of urgency. Um, you know what what would you encourage them to think about, um, and how might they develop their um, their art making according to that uh, that idea of urgency? Yeah, I think uh, I mean for me when I was an art student, uh, I. I also was just not into seeing things separately, right? So issues that were happening in my community, you know, when I was going to like my second year of um, my undergraduate degree, uh, which I left my home territories and uh, for, um, there was a major standoff between the Canadian government and um, our people at a place called Gustafson Lake where people were sun dancing. It was on rancher's land and the Canadian government literally used armored personnel carriers um, in this, uh, in this, um, uh, offensive against uh, people. And so that urgency was something that was always present. I think it is for many of you, right? When you see, like, when we look at our realities, like um, poverty in our communities, um, you know, um, all kinds of things that are affecting us. So uh, that urgency is there. And I don't think you have to see it as separate, right? So I think that's the trick is, um, is not creating those barriers anymore or not continuing them where, okay, but that's happening there and I'm here to do this. We can, right? You can bring that um, in. And for me, that's, I'm always interested in, in artwork like that. So, you know, I think sometimes you get different messages, right? And sometimes maybe you're getting the message that, oh, if I make the work too controversial, people are not going to be interested in it or supportive of it. It all depends on who your audience is for that work, right? And what you're making it for. So I think it's about, um, you know, checking in with yourself too, and, um, and just like going for it, the, trying to not sort of hold yourself back, which I think is in the end, what we end up doing a lot of, um, uh, you know, not to mention many um, critiques of uh, the Western centric nature of, of contemporary art. But uh, I think sometimes, um, we're holding ourselves back if we uh, if we kind of question the space of there being an urgency. But it's it's fair too in that it, it's also fair that um, some curators are are not interested in that, right? So it's like this this journey where you're you you need to find the people that you can be in conversation with and your work can be in conversation with, and um, that takes some time, but but I'm into it. So, you know, there's people who, there's people who want to hear that voice. There's people who want to hear that urgency and activism and, and advocacy. And I think those are the people you need to find or, or make your own scene. Right. That's the other thing is like, you know, we all are doing our time and doing our projects and our generations and our thing, but um, you know, that's very much what I was engaged in as, as a younger art student is, um, we created organizations, you know, we made, we put on shows, um, we brought, poli you know, we'd had info tables for politics at those shows or um, at those exhibitions, we would hold our own exhibitions. Um, so like, that's such an important um, space to have emergent practice and voices. Um, so, I, you know, self-organized, self-directed way of working and, um, yeah, encourage people to continue that, which I'm sure many of you are engaged in, right? In your own communities or scenes or ideas. 